Hey everybody, Spiceman here from Airwing 11. In this video, I thought I would uh, walk through a cold start of the Tomcat um, in anticipation of the uh, Heepler's Tomcat coming out this winter, wet our appetite a little bit, uh, maybe share a little sea story along the way. Um, I found a good video on the web of a um, Tomcat cold start. So I thought I would walk through that. Um, it kind of starts with the windmill on the right engine, so I'll just kind of talk through um, what happened prior to this video starting, the windmilling of the left engine and what have you. Um, first things first, so they're here on the line, they've got power and air uh, applied to the Tomcat. You know, the Tomcat doesn't have an APU, it doesn't have a, a battery or an APU, so you have to supply it with um, AC power. Um, 115 volts AC, 400 hertz, three phase power um, comes from on this particular line here, comes from this ground power unit over here, plugs into a port right behind the main landing gear there. You plug the cord in, you energize it, uh, and there's a button you press to apply power. Um, on the line, they usually come from these ground power units. If you're lucky, if not, the, there's a um, uh, uh, device GSE, uh, you have to drive around to supply power. It's not much fun to have to hunt one down to get power on if you don't have one of these power units on the line. Um, on the boat, power comes out of a battle hatch. Um, on the deck of the uh, of the boat, there's um, battle hatches scattered around. You carry around a battle hatch wrench to open the thing up. And in there is a power cord um, that you can pull out uh, and get power that way. It's a bit of a pain. It takes two people because uh, it's a momentary switch in the battle hatch on the boat. So you got to have two guys, one to kind of hold that switch while the other one presses the button um, on the Tomcat to energize uh, the power. The other thing in that battle hatch is a um, SINS cable hookup. Uh, that's how you align the INS um, on the Tomcat on the boat. There's two ways to do it. If the ship is broadcasting the SINs over the data link, um, you can use that SINs, uh, ship, SINs a search, ship's inertial navigation system. You can use that broadcast um, uh, feed from the, from the ship's inertial navigation system to feed the Tomcat's INS to get it aligned. If they're not broadcasting that, you gotta lug around this um, SINs cable. Um, it's a, thick yellow cable on uh, one end will plug into the SINs um, connector inside the battle hatch. The other end plugs into the SINs connector on the Tomcat, which is up inside um, the nose wheel well. So you, you need that for a launch um, for a carrier alignment on the beach. Uh, you can do a ground alignment and manually enter in um, the, your, your Latin long for the alignment there. And then the other thing they got here is uh, is compressed air source here, uh, Huffer called it on the boat. Uh, the Huffers are attached to the uh, tow tractors on the beach. If you're lucky, you have a, a ground power unit that also supplies compressed air. If not, you gotta lug around, um, tow around this Huffer to get your compressed air that way. But regardless, you need um, AC power and compressed air uh, on the Tomcat. Um, now, so what they did here before um, before this video started, number one, they had power applied, the air crew got in the plane, um, and they ran um, some tests. So up in the cockpit is this master test panel. Um, it's um, back on the right-hand console. So when the air crew got in, got strapped on, they made sure power was applied, and they ran through a couple tests on the master test panel. The way this thing works is that um, you pull this knob up, you turn it, and then you push it down to initiate the test. So um, before um, startup, they ran a lights test, made sure all the lights were working in both the front and the back seat. They ran fire detection test. Fire detection test is, um, uh, you'll get a note, you, if it works, you'll get a go light on the master test panel, uh, the left and right fire lights uh, will come on. Um, it checks several things. It uh, verifies um, continuity through the squibs, the little 
explosive devices that um, uh, fire off the uh, extinguisher system verifies that's good I think it measures for voltage present at the uh, fire uh, extinguisher switches um, uh, on the front panel and uh, I think it also checks that the fire bottles are actually um, pressurized as well um, so the pilot did that and then the pilot also um, did an instrument check when you do the instrument check um, a bunch of the tapes run to preset um, positions uh, the RPM the EGT the fuel flow tapes went to preset positions the AOA indexer the wing sweep indicator went to um, preset positions is a good chest the fuel quantity uh, went to 2,000 pounds in both the indicator in the front and the indicator in the rear seat uh, went to 2,000 pounds the oxygen quantity went to two liters the f14 a and b use uh, liquid oxygen bottles uh, i believe it's two bottles and i think they're 10 liters each um, but uh, so the oxygen quantity indicator went to two liters as part of a good instrument test um, the left and right fuel low um, lights came on as part of that instrument test so that that's an instrument test so um, pilot needs to run through those three tests before um, telling the plane captain to go ahead and uh, put the air on for for startup so they did that and then um, they windmilled the left engine which we didn't see here now when you windmill um, the engines you also bleed the hydraulics um, so the troubleshooter um, as part of the engine windmill is bleeding the hydraulics so they did that on the left and now they're doing it on the right you can see uh, the plane captain's giving the windmill signal this guy is uh, bleeding the hydraulics he's either doing that or taking a sample so um, the uh, a the f-14 a's uh, you had to bleed the hydraulics on it on every start it's now at some point uh, the Tomcats uh, implemented a uh, auto bleeder or a self bleeder on the hydraulic systems and you didn't need to bleed the hydraulics on every um, every time you you windmill the engine so this guy might just be getting a sample because he's not carrying around a bucket it looks like he's carrying around you know just a bottle maybe for a sample but um, but he, he, regardless he's uh, he's getting some hydraulic fluid um, out and when he's got a good sample you saw him just kick his foot there he's telling the plane captain he's got a good um, sample if he's actually bleeding the hydraulics um, he's uh, waiting for you know any air to come out and get a good just solid hydraulic fluid stream and then he's telling the plane captain you know, you know he's good um, so that's good uh, and now it looks like they lost power for whatever reason you see the anti-collision light went out so the plane captain is like hey you need to turn power back on that's that's the only thing they're doing here but they got power back on all right so now um they're windmilling the engine um and actually what they're doing here they're they're um uh they're wiping the stick uh so the other thing the pilot is doing right now prior to actually starting the engine is he's testing the emergency um flight hydraulic pump so the emergency flight hydraulic pump the switch is also on the master test panel um, it's a electrically driven hydraulic pump um, so what it what it does it has two modes low and high it provides emergency um, hydraulic uh, pressure in the event the uh, hydraulic pump fails uh, and the pilot is cycling it from low to high um, and wiping the stick just to make sure just to verify that it's working he's got good hydraulic pressure I believe that Tomcat can run indefinitely uh, with it in low uh, and in high I uh, believe you get eight minutes of um, hydraulic pressure uh, running it on on high but that's what he's doing right now um, and in the cockpit he's looking for a that he's got hydraulic pressure and B that um, on the hydraulic pressure indicator there's the emergency flight um, two windows there. The flags will go from off to on when he's uh, cycling that emergency flight hydraulic pump. So that's what he's doing now. He's running that um, and he's wiping the stick as he's doing that. And then when that's good, he'll give a thumbs up and then uh, 
the plane captain will go ahead and have him windmill and start. And so what he's doing now, um, the engine crank sw switch here on the panel, just outboard of the throttle, uh, put the crank switch in right, right? The engine will windmill. Uh, when it gets to 20%, um, he'll go around the horn on the throttle, bring it out of um, idle cutoff into idle, uh, and then the engine should light off. He's also keeping his finger on that because this uh, crank switch um, auto centers when um, it gets to 50% RPM and the pilot's making sure that happens because if it doesn't, something is broken or whatever and it doesn't um, uh, shut the starter off at 50% there, you could burn up the starter. So that's the other thing the pilot is watching for as he's um, starting the engine. So there's the engines started. Um, so now I was giving the um, plane captain the signal to um, remove electrical power. This guy's pulling the power cord off, closing the latch. The other guys are pulling air. Looks like they're going to do a cross bleed start. Um, normally we you'd keep the air on uh, for both you know, engine starts, but their power, their compressed air is probably down on their line here, and they need to go use that huffer somewhere else. So they're pulling power off. On the boat, um, we normally do cross bleed starts as well as a rule, only because you know there's not an infinite number of huffers on the boat, and you got a lot of planes to start. So um, we typically do cross bleed starts um, on the boat as well. So. Now, since they're doing a cross bleed start, the other thing that pilot is doing is selecting the right engine as the air source, so so that they have uh, cooling air since they they've lost the compressed air from the hopper. So. so now they're going to um, crank the left engine. Once the plane cat gets out of the way, <laughs> now. Now, uh, when they crank the left engine, what the what the pilot's going to do is he's going to um, windmill the engine, let the hydro hydraulic pressure come up, um, and then he's going to center the crank switch and, and stop the windmill. And he's going to test the hydraulic transfer pump. It's also called a bi-die or bidirectional pump. What it is is a pump that has two impellers, um, one on each hydraulic system. Tomcat's got two hi hydraulic systems. The flight hydraulic system driven by the right engine uh, is the primary for the flight controls. And then the combined hydraulic system driven by the left engine um, is the hydraulics for the non-flight controls. Um, and this pump has an impeller in, in both systems kind of driven by each one. So um, uh, as part of the pre-flight, this switch is actually shut, set to shut off. It's actually one of the few guarded switches in the cockpit that you want up um, as part of the pre-flight and you want the hydraulic transfer pump and shut off. So what he's going to do is um, he's going to crank the left engine, let the pressure come up, um, center the crank switch, let the pressure fall again, um, and then uh, put the hydraulic transfer pump into normal and just verify that that bidirectional pump is pressurizing the, um, the combined hydraulic system off of the flight hydraulic system. I believe that BIDI can uh, keep, will keep that uh, uh, combined hydraulic system between 2,400 and 2,600 psi or so. Um, so that's that's used in case you lose one of your hydraulic pumps uh, after startup. So that's what he's doing right now: is cranking, uncranking, testing the hydraulic transfer pump, and then he's going to put it back into shut off, um, and then go ahead and start the left engine normally.
All right, so now the left engine is started. Um, the plane captain should be given the signal to remove the um, the wheel locks. So, yeah, swiping down the arms there. That's the signal to the guys to pull out, pull off the uh, down locks for the landing gear. Now, the other, th the, um, other thing the pilot is going to do now while they're doing that is turn on the um, stability augmentation system, um, engage the uh, pitch roll and yaw computers, and check the fault display for any um, faults uh, on that system. Uh, and then the other thing he's going to do after that is um, test the emergency generator test. So it's going to put the master test into um, emergency generator test. Um, to test that, look for a good um, go light. The uh, AC contactors will switch over um, to the emergency generator. Um, so he's doing that. Now when he does that, um, the he'll get a bunch of caution lights out of that uh, um, FCS system there. So um, he'll have to hit the master reset to reset those when he's done that. So the master resets on the pilot's left vertical panel there. Um, so once he's done that test, he'll, he'll, he'll hit that to um, reset those caution lights from the FCS system there. So he's doing that. And then um, after that's done, he's um, telling the Rio to go ahead and that he's done those tests and the Rio can t turn up the radar, turn up um, the AUG-9. So the Rio at this point is going to go ahead and turn up um, the AUG-9. He didn't want to do it before this because you don't want you know, while the AUG-9 is starting up to have that emergency generator test run and um, interrupt power like that. So so now the, the Rio is going to turn on um, the radar. Uh, and when it comes up, what the first thing it does is it runs auto sequence two. Um, the, the radar has eight um, bit tests that it can run. Talk about those a little bit. Um, the first one is bit one. That's a display test. It puts um, test displays up on the, the TID and the and the DDD in the back seat. Um, you don't normally run that unless you think uh, you have a problem. Um, sequence two is the computer subsystem test, uh, and that runs automatically when the radar powers on. So that's what it's doing now. On the TID display, sorry, I don't have a better picture of the TID. This is just kind of out of the NATOP. So this is kind of the initial display um, that you see when auto sequence two is running. Um, it's got uh, a bit box uh, there uh, with uh, the two in the top left for sequence two is running. The bottom left is a little indicator of whether the test is passed or not. You'll get a check mark if it's passed. You'll get a D um, if it's degraded. Um, and then down in the bottom here is a list of the uh, of the radar modes that it's checking during this um, sequence two test. Um, and above each one of these, you'll get an X or a D or a check mark if it's if it's passed. So that's kind of what it looks like. Sequence two um, rarely fails. In my 10 years on the Tomcat, I didn't see sequence two um, fail much. Uh, I did see uh the computer subsystem either usually working or it's not um if it's not working you normally what you see is it wouldn't start whatsoever and you'd get this hard failure indication of sequence two which is um, you'll get no display at all on the tid and uh, the sequence two button will start flashing and that's normally a complete failure of the uh of the tape drive system so the tomcat is pretty old technology, right? So the memory on the Tomcat is actually on magnetic tape. It's on like cassette tapes. And so um, an auto sequence to hard failure is usually a result of the of the tape drive and it's just not loading um, the computer memory at all. That's what would normally happen if um, the computer subsystem was going to fail. But that's auto sequence two and that's running now. Um, so that's what the Rio um, is doing. Talk about those other bit tests here a little bit. So the other main bit test that the Rio is going to want to run on the ground is um, sequence three, which is the uh, it's the overall confidence test. It's labeled here on the computer address panel. It's AMCS confidence. AMCS, I think, is airborne 
missile control system, or maybe it's AUG-9 missile control system. But, um, but that's sort of an overall confidence test. It tests a little bit of everything. Um, the other sequences are sequence four, which is a um, missile on aircraft test. It tests uh, the missile uh, subsystems. I think the, the missiles you get tuned during this test as well. Um, sequence five is a radar receiver test. In the front of the radome is a little uh, waveguide horn that's inside there. And the radar actually sends itself a little test target. Um, and uh, sequence five tests the radar receiver's ability to um, to uh, receive that sort of test target. Um, sequence six is a transmitter test that uh, is a detailed bit tests of the radar transmitter subsystem. Um, puts it through its paces. It doesn't actually um, when you're on when you're on the deck. There is a um, a coaxial or a waveguide switch inside the transmitter that switches in a dummy load. So you're not actually radiating, any, radiating anything when you've got the transmitter on, on on the ground. It switches in a dummy load. When you go right off wheels, um, that dummy load is switched out. But So sequence 6 is a transmitter test. Sequence 7 is an antenna um, test. Puts the antenna through its various um, pointing modes. Uh, the antenna on, on the Tomcat is hydraulically driven. It's not actually driven off the Tomcat's hydraulic system. It has its own self-contained little hydraulic system, hydraulic pump in the antenna itself. Um, and you can feel the during that sequence test. You, you know, we don't fly in a simulator. We don't actually get to feel the machine around us. But uh, that antenna is actually pretty um, strong. And you can kind of feel it chunking around. Um, up through your seat and up through your feet when that antenna is going through that uh, antenna bit sequence there. But that's what antenna, uh, that's what sequence seven is, an antenna test. Sequence eight is a um, single target track test. It again uses that um, that uh, waveguide horn in the front of the radome that um, the radar will actually give itself a target to lock onto. And sequence eight basically locks onto that target and tracks it um, from and through its range from, I think, I can't remember what distance the, this fake target starts at, but it starts at some distance and the radar kind of tracks it in close during this um, sequence eight test. Um, and then what you have on the display, there's a little different display for each one of those um, bit sequences. And uh, if anything fails during that test, it'll they're called DPs or decision points. Um, so it'll list the decision points, the little test points that failed during that test. And based on what they are, it's either, uh, yeah, I don't worry about it, or, yeah, that's, you know, that's not going to work. And so um, you have to you know, change, you know, one of the boxes or whatever based on, you know, what test failed or what DP. You have a little book called a bit book that you look up these DPs and based on what they are, um, based on the bit book and based on your own experience, you'll know um, what box you have to change to correct that um, that failed bit sequence. But So that's a little bit on uh, bit sequences. So that's what the Rio is doing um, right now, turning up the AUG-9, running auto sequence two. And then the plane captain, it's hard to see here, he's giving a, a T, um, signal there with his hands telling the pilot that uh, uh, to run um, OBC or onboard checkout. So that's what they're going to do after the radar gets um, booted up. Uh, they're looking at the ramps here right now to see if um, OBC is started. So one of the things that OBC does is it does a bit test of the uh, the ramps, the uh, AICS, the Airborne Inlet Control System. And then during that bit test, the system will cycle um, the inlet ramps. So in order to run OBC, um, the pilot in the front seat will put the master test into OBC. Uh, and the Rio in the back seat will select OBC on the computer address panel. Uh, and it gets this display here on, on the TID in the back seat. Now, which when they do that, which uh, which actual tests are run are a function of which interlocks are made or not on the Tomcat. Um, when you're on the deck and the parking brake is set 
and you have weight on wheels, and I think that flaps have to be up and the throttle below a certain percent. There's a certain set of interlocks um, that based on which interlocks are made um, is what tests will be run. The one on the ground during startup, I believe, is called Class 2A um, OBC uh, with the interlocks that are in place now. Um, and it'll test a bunch of stuff. And there's a list of, of subsystems on the TID. And as each one of these tests is kicked off, um, that subsystem will start flashing. So for example, uh, you can see there's acronyms here for the countermeasure system, for the IFF transponder, for the control indicator. The control indicator is, is the missile um, launching subsystem. Um, the main part of that being the CI. The CI is the panel at the Rio's left knee where he selects what missiles to launch and can initiate the launch of a Phoenix on that. So, so that is testing that system. It's testing the uh, Beacon Augmenter, which is like the ACLS. Uh, it's testing the flight controls, the AICS, the ramps. That's when the ramps start coming down. Uh, I can't remember what all these acronyms are. The CAD is the CADC. The CADC is kind of the heart of uh, the flight control um, electronics, the sort of the brain behind the flight controls. It's a box that takes inputs from a lot of different systems um, and provides outputs to a lot of different systems, the pitch roll and yaw computers. It gets inputs from um, the PETA static system. It's got uh, PETA static uh, um, you know, plumbing, you know, sort of into it. So it, it knows, you know, the static pressure and the pitot pressure. It's what provides outputs to um, the roll computer, like when the pilot throws the stick, right? If you're at high speed, the CADC is going to say, we don't need to spoil those. We're, we're at high speed here. We'll just do it with differential stabs. But if you're at low speed, um, you know, on the stick, the stick has a transducer. A transducer basically turns a physical force into a voltage, um, and that goes to the CADC. So if you're at low speed and the pilot is throwing the stick with a certain pressure, well, the CADC says, hey, I'm below a certain speed. I'm getting this um, input pressure from the control stick here. I'm going to throw the spoilers up. Right? So the, D so the C CADC will raise the spoilers. CADC decides uh, where to sweep the wings. It's, it's, it's got the wing sweep schedule in it, and based on airspeed and pressure and altitude is going to decide, you know, where the wings should be. So the CADC is kind of the heart of the um, the flight control brains there. Um, the other things that it's, it's OBC is testing is the radar warning, the radar altimeter, the TACAN, the display group. I um, can't remember what these other ones are. No, DLS, it would be the data link system. So each one of these as it's being tested, will start blinking, um, and then when the test is complete, uh, I believe it lights up bright uh, when that test is complete. So that's what it's doing. That's what OBC is doing, pretty thorough check. Now, the other thing you see in the display here is um, the, the INS alignment. So there's some tick marks running across the screen here just for the status of the INS alignment. There's a little carrot here that kind of marches across the screen once the alignment is going. Um, it reaches a point for a course align, and then the carrot becomes a diamond. And then for a final line, um, the diamond gets a dot in the middle, telling you that the INS is through its fine alignment. Uh, so that's the other thing going on on the screen here. Uh, above here, you see a, something called a flycatcher. Flycatcher is kind of synonymous with the, uh, the Blin codes from the Hornet. They're basically memory locations. You can enter in a flycatcher number here, which is a memory location, and it'll give you um, some bit results or uh, bit flags from those memory locations. You can look these up, um, and it'll tell you, um, uh, you know, what's what's set in that in that memory location based on this what you're seeing here for the flycatcher. I think one of the actual NATOP supplementals um, has all the flycatchers and what the Rio um, should be seeing here for, for these various flycatchers. Um, the maintenance guys, um, there's some flycatchers that the maintenance guys use a lot as well. Um, and in that bit book I mentioned earlier, they'll have what you should be seeing in those maintenance flycatchers for these memory locations. So that's the other thing you see up here is flycatcher. And then above that, you see the Latin long um, 
uh, that the system is either getting from the carrier via that RF SINs or the SINs cable, as I mentioned before, or on the on the on the beach, the Rio would enter um, the lat and long um, here as well. So this looks like uh, so here's latitude north 34 degrees 57, longitude west 115 is on the west coast somewhere. So it's funny after so many years on the Tomcat, I remember the Latin long for the ramp at Oceana. It was Latin north 36489, longitude west 76022. It's funny. Remember certain things after all these years. I've done it so many times. But so that's what's going on during um, OBC. And the plane captain <clears throat> is watching to see the ramp start to come down. That's the plane captain's sign that uh, OBC has started. So there the ramps start cycling down. So now. They're moving on to the next um, test here. Um, he's got them opening up the uh, refueling probe. So the pilot's doing that. That's on the pilot's left uh, vertical panel there. The other thing the pilot is doing during here, I think you can hear the engine <clears throat> gun a little bit, is he's testing the, um, the AFTC or the augmenter fan temperature controller. What That system is basically the electronic brain of the engine. Uh, kind of like the CADC, electronic brain of the flight control system. Well, the AFTC is kind of the electronic brain of the engine. It gets inputs from lots of various um, sources and controls things like, um, you know, the fuel control, um, you know, the, the guide vanes at the, at the front of the engine that, you know, turn to control the air geometry of the air entering the engines they control the uh, afterburner fuel controller all those things if you're any of you out there familiar with civilian planes there's a system called FADEC that they use for civilian planes well this is a kind of a similar thing um, on the Tomcat the AFTC and it has sort of a fail-safe mode normally it's in primary but it has a secondary sort of fail-safe mode and what the pilot is doing is he's putting uh, each, each engine in turn into secondary and verifying. When it's in operating in secondary mode, it's more of a hydro-mechanical type control um, of the engine. Um, and indications when you're, it's in secondary mode in the cockpit is the nozzles. Well, there's a light that lights up in the caution advisory panel, but also uh, it closes the nozzles on the ground. Um, so he's looking for that. When you're also in secondary mode in flight, afterburner is inhibited, and I believe the uh, thrust is derated based on a schedule of altitudes or whatever. Uh, thrust is degraded or uh, derated a little bit in secondary mode as well. But the pilot is put in, putting them in secondary, checking for the light, and then uh, in the nozzles, and I think probably bumping the throttles as well to just to make sure that there still is throttle control in, in secondary mode. I think that's the test of the. Uh, AFTC. So that's the other thing he's doing um, here in this portion of the startup. <clears throat> so now um, plane captain have opened the speed brake. Speed brakes on the throttle. Kind of similar location there. Um, it's the Hornet. Um, so he's opening the speed brakes and looking on the uh, surface position indicator, uh, making sure he's got a good speed brake indicator there. That's the other thing he's doing now. Speed brakes, close the probe. So now the other thing the pilot is verifying is um, that uh, the DFCS uh, indications there that uh, that's no fault indications there as a result of OBC. I was getting them to open the wings, but that was a mistake. It's not time to open the wings yet. The next thing that they're going to do is a trim check. So um, the pilot is going to run uh, the trim completely through its range of 
travel. So he's going to go full um, nose up, full nose down on the trim, full right wing down, full left wing down. So that's the other thing they're doing here. Talk about some of the roles here of these guys while they're doing that. So um, this guy's playing captain. Um, this is probably a guy working on the line who's not yet playing captain. He's kind of a, an assistant. These other guys that you see around, they're probably um, guys from the troubleshooter shop. So what the troubleshooter shop is, um, they're the guys that do the servicing uh, of the plane. They service the hydraulics, um, change tires you know, brakes and stuff like that, you know, that sort of stuff. Um, <clears throat> and these light bulbs burnt out, they'll be, they'll change those. Um, and they'll sign off on the plane captain's inspections. There's two types of inspections the plane captain does on the plane. There's a turnaround inspection after, between flights um, that the plane captain will do. It's basically just checking fluid levels and pneumatic um, levels and whatnot, and then there's a daily inspection the plane captain will do at the end of the after the last flight of every day, which is a little bit more thorough. Um, but the troubleshooter will sign off any um, discrepancies from those types of inspections. The other thing the troubleshooters do is uh, the, they're the final checkers on the cat. You've ever seen the videos of plane coming up to the catapult? <clears throat> the troubleshooters meet it. They do a walk around um, when the plane's in in tension and uh, and an afterburner and they wipe the stick. The troubleshooters are um, at the rear of the plane there. They're watching that and they give their thumbs up. Uh, the shooter on the cat, there's several thumbs up he needs to get. Ever seen the video? He kind of points it three different places and then does his thumbs up thing to shoot the plane. Well, one of the folks that he's pointing at is the troubleshooter. So the troubleshooters at the back of the plane, they kind of get down on, on one knee so they can see each other. The troubleshooter on the side where the shooter is, um, they both, you know, watch the stick wipe out, make sure there's no leaks, that the spoilers pop up, you know, all that sort of stuff. And then the pilot on the shooter side will um, get the thumbs up from the pilot on the far side or from the troubleshooter on the far side. He sees that he'll give his own thumbs up to the shooter. And that's one of the three things the shooter is kind of pointing at during that sequence there is the troubleshooter, just the squadron guy, just getting a thumbs up, you know, that the, that the plane is good to go. I think the other thing the shooter points out is the, the guys that, you know, put the holdback fitting on and then the guy that actually is operating the, the catapult, he gets thumbs up from those three guys and then, you know, does his cool, you know, shooter thing. So, so that's a troubleshooter. That's what, that's what they are. They can come from any shop in the squadron. I was a troubleshooter for a while and I was an avionics guy. Um, you know, I was in the IWT, the integrated weapons team. So I was an avionics guy, but I did a tour in the troubleshooters, changing tires and brakes and stuff as well. Um, so it, troubleshooters kind of a rotational type thing. These guys come from, can come from any of the shops in the squadron, avionics, airframes, power plants, you know, whatever. <clears throat> so that's the kind of the guys you're looking at here. So that guy gets thumbs up from the speed brakes guy. So now um, I believe they're going to go ahead and spread the wings. Now on the boat, this will be the end of it, right? You do the trim check and and you're done because obviously you're not spreading the wings on the boat. But here um, on the beach, they're spreading the wings and running through that part of the startup. So now the pilot is putting the wings forward with the uh, with the wing sweep handle, um, checking those indications. Uh, quick. Uh, Look here at the wing sweep indicator. Wing, wing sweep indicator's got three kind of tapes to it, three bars. Um, on the very rightmost is the current wing sweep position. Uh, the middle one is the commanded wing sweep position. 
And then the left one is the forward most allowed wing sweep position. This is the, the CADC saying, hey, based on flight conditions, this is as far as I'm going to allow the wing sweep to go. Um, so if the pilot was trying to, you know, on the throttle, there's the, uh, the wing sweep. Uh, it's this uh, bottom one here. It's got fore and aft, which are momentary. It's got bomb, which is a um, detented position. You put it in bomb, it'll stay there. And it's got auto, which is also a detented position. You put it in auto, it'll stay there. But let's say the pilot tried to drive the wings forward. The wings would not go any farther forward than that um, that indication there on the left. And once, if he, let's just say he just kept the button mashed down, the wings would stop sweeping at that point and enter auto mode. Uh, once they got to that forwardmost point, so that's what that is. It's the it's the most forward point. The CADC is going to allow the wings to to sweep. So he's sweeping the wings out, <clears throat> and then he's going to put the flaps down, flap handle, uh, flaps controls flaps and slats. They're not controlled separately, and then they're wiping the stick, checking for the throttles. I mean the spoilers to cycle now he's still in the rudders and now he's going to do the spoilers now there's like three different checks here for the spoilers there's like a lot going on here in the next uh sort of seven seconds so um what the pilot is doing is number one he's he's testing the spoiler brakes right he's putting the spoiler brakes in the spoiler brake spoilers will pop up He's testing that, uh, A, that they come up, B, that if he bumps the throttle off of idle, that they'll go back down. He's checking that. He's checking DLC, direct lift control. What that is, um, when certain interlocks are made and you and you press the DLC uh, engage uh, button here on the stick, it engages DLC. And when DLC is engaged, the inboard spoilers go up 17 degrees. Um, and then the pilot can roll them up and down from there with the uh, with the DLC thumb wheel, so that's he's um, there. He's testing the direct lift control. That's an important system for landing on the boat. Um, you don't uh, uh, take off on the boat if DLC uh, is not working. So um, uh, that's DLC. The other thing he's doing is a bit of the uh, FCS, putting the master tests into FCS bit. Um, which arms it, and then he's engaging the autopilot, and that runs uh, FCS bit, and then he's looking for any fault displays there. So that's all going on here in these few seconds that uh, you see these spoilers going up and down. So now they're closing the flaps and slats. Flap handle. <laughs> um, and now um, they're putting the maneuver flaps down. So the other thing, based on what interlocks are are made, that the flaps aren't all the way down, uh, this is now a maneuvering flap thumb wheel. So what that is, is um, the pilot can roll the maneuvering flaps down uh, with the thumb wheel, roll them up and down. So that's what he's checking now. And now he's putting the wings um, back into bomb. This is the uh, wing sweep uh, hat switch on the throttle. Uh, talked about it's got the fore and aft and auto and then bomb. So he's putting them back into bomb now, switch the wings back to 55 degrees. And the maneuvering flaps um, come up. And then he's putting the wings full back and then into oversweep. So to put the wings in oversweep um, from 68 degrees is you, move, you, you use the, the emergency wing sweep handle. Um, now the Tomcat has airbags uh, back here. Uh, they're fed from bleed air from the engines to inflate these airbags. Uh, when the wings are swept back, these airbags inflate uh, to kind of seal the area you know, underneath the wings. Uh, well, those airbags have to be have to deflate in order to put the uh, the wings into oversweep. So lifting up this emergency wing sweep handle bleeds the air out of the airbags and deflates those. 
Now, the other thing that has to happen is the uh, the the travel of the horizontal stabilators needs to be limited for the wings to be in wing sweep. And so the pot's looking for um, the uh, horizontal tail authority light um, to go out on the uh, caution advisory panel is a sign that uh, the system is ready for the wings to go into oversweep. And then when those two things happen, when he sees that light go out, he can then uh, move the wing sweep handle back into oversweep and the wings will go into oversweep. And so now they'll move on to, I believe they'll put it in, uh, oh, they're doing the uh, anti-skid test. So the anti-skid test is uh, the anti-skid spoiler brake switch should be in both. And then what they'll, they'll do is the pilot will release the parking brake, hold the tow brakes, and then this guy is going up into the wheel well here. There is an anti-skid bit box up there, and he's pressing the bit button on the anti-skid bit box. And you got to hold it for 10 seconds, I think, to initiate the test. And then these bit flags will flip, showing a good bit test. And up in the cockpit, uh, the pilot will feel, you know, the brakes release. Um, and that's a sign of a good anti-skid bit test. So that's what they're doing here now. So now they'll put it in kneel. Um, you put it in kneel as the switch is there by the uh, by the landing gear handle. What that does is it lets hydraulic fluid out of the nose strut. There's a kneel valve on the top of the uh, of the nose strut uh, to extend the nose strut. Let's combine hydraulic fluid into the strut. When you put it in kneel, it lets that hydraulic fluid out of the strut. Gravity um, will push the hydraulic fluid out and um, Kneel the plane, and so that you do that on the cat. So that's what he's doing. Um, and then when you're when you've got it kneeled, the launch bar can come down. There's a latch, um, you know, for the let the launch bar down. You can either hold it while the plane is going into kneel, and the launch bar will come down. Or after the plane's in kneel, you can push the launch bar up a little bit, take the tension off of that latch. Uh, he's showing him how to do it here. I guess he's a new guy, um, and um, they're letting the launch bar down. So that's the launch bar, and then the um, plane captains give them a signal to, you know, forearm up is the signal to go to launch bar abort, test that out. It's a guarded switch on the left uh, vertical panel there to raise the launch bar in case you just abort, had to abort the, the cat, whatever. Um, launch bar abort, and he puts it back down. So they're doing that, and then he's signaling to drop the tail hook. Uh, the guy's checking out the tail hook, looking for hydraulic leaks or whatever in the tail hook mechanism. And then he's going to have him raise the tail hook. And when he raises the tail hook, the guy's going to give it a good shove um, to test the uh, tail hook centering spring just to make sure that's uh, in good shape. He's doing that, and then they'll bring it up out of kneel. And then they're all good, and they're going to pull the chocks and taxi. Now, the the thing they have left to do here is the final walk around. You can either do that. Most of the squadrons I was in, we did the final walk around right, right there in spot. Um, but here in this squadron, maybe they do it some other place on the line. Maybe they taxi to the end of the line first and do the final walk around there. But they, the, the one thing that they do after this is the, uh, is the final walk around. But... Uh, they're doing that someplace else, apparently. So they're just taxiing. Just going to test the nose wheel steering there, probably give the brakes a bump, make sure that they're working, and then taxi off. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this a little uh, preview of a cold start. Uh, for the Tomcat, and it's uh, whip your appetite a little bit, so we can all look forward to uh, getting the Tomcat in their hands.